All right, so recording another message from my office just because I really want to make sure this gets published. Uh, we had a lot of sound issues just kind of happen sporadically on Sunday, so I apologize. Um, hopefully this is clear and you can hear me okay. I'm not going to try and replicate everything uh, that came on Sunday, um, but I do want to make sure that this message, because we began a new series on Sunday, I want to make sure that uh, at least there's some recording of this so that uh, you can go back and listen for a point of reference. Now, if you, have, if you have your Bible and you are wanting to follow along, you'll want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And before we get into that, I want to talk to you for just a second about joy. When was the last time you experienced joy in your church or in your faith or in your relationship with Christ? Maybe even just true joy in your life in general. Uh, so many people, they, they, all, they get out of bed on Sunday and it's this attitude of, oh, I got to go to church or I have to get the kids ready and this is more work than it's worth. And, and very quickly, our joy begins to erode. I don't like to say that our joy gets taken from us, but we exchange it for something else a lot of times. And a lot of times we just let our joy go. Well, we're beginning a series uh, starting with this message, the one I delivered on Sunday. And uh, it's on joy that we have in Christ. And it's going to take us on into the new year, uh, right through Christmas and everything. We're going to look at joy in our hope, joy in our salvation. Pastor Calvin is going to preach on joy and repentance. At least that's the, the current plan. Joy in grace, joy in faith, joy in the word of God, joy in Christ, joy in our worship, and even joy in our suffering. And that's how we'll end it. Now, if you were to pull up a Strong's Concordance, it's a very thick book that has almost every word in the Bible found inside it and, and the original meaning in Greek and Hebrew, things like that in Aramaic. And if you were to find joy, now most of us know joy is a big part of the Christian life. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit, which I'll get to in a moment. But if you were to pull up a Strong's Concordance and try to find joy, you'd find it only takes up about a third of one page. Even if you were to take all the various meanings of joy and, and tenses of the word joy, even the word rejoice, it might equal a page and a half, maybe. Uh, so the, the Bible doesn't use a lot of words for joy and it doesn't use the word joy very often, but what it does say is powerful and very important. In the Hebrew, we first really see the word joy appear in 1 Samuel 18 verse 6, when the women come out singing in front of Saul. If you recall, David had just killed Goliath. They've routed the Philistines. Saul gets very angry because these women are singing with joy about David and how many people he's killed versus how many people Saul has killed. And so he gets very upset at their joy. And the Bible tells us they were rejoicing with joy, or some translations say gladness. We see this later, this, this, another word, another Hebrew word gets used later in Ezra chapter 6, when they rededicate or, or dedicate the new rebuilt temple with joy, Ezra 6.16. Now, throughout the Old Testament, for the most part, we see the same two Hebrew words used. Simha, which means jubilation or merriment, which is what those young ladies were, were dancing and singing in. And then we see another word, hedva, which means a great happiness and pleasure. Then we come to the New Testament in the Greek in which it was written. And predominantly, we only see one word throughout most of the New Testament. Different tenses, but the same word is chaira. And it's very similar to hedva, and it means to be filled with a great happiness and pleasure. But then we get all the way to the book of Jude, the second to last book of your Bible. And at the very end of his little letter, 25 verses and the whole thing, verse 24, he uses the word agaliesis, which is joy as exaltation. We may even say that, that it is joy as worship. He writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless 
with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Joy is such a big part of the Christian life. And so today we're going to begin to count our joys when we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now the sermon title for today, or this past Sunday, was Joy in Our Hope. Joy in Our Hope. The joy of the Christian, and if you're taking notes, if you like to do that sort of thing, the joy of the Christian rests in the hope we have in Christ and in his return. That's what, that's what I would challenge you to write down today. The joy we have as Christians rests in the hope we have in Christ and in his return. George Herbert, the Welsh poet of the 16th and 17th centuries, he once wrote, He that lives in hope danceth without music. That's one of the most beautiful phrases I could ever think of to describe the life of a Christian in hope. Many times we read this text in one of two contexts, this, this passage in 1 Thessalonians. Either we're studying biblical prophecy or we're at a funeral. But Paul is sending a message of joy to the Thessalonian church, a joy that cannot be taken from them because it is based in their hope in Christ. Not just any hope, but hope that is founded upon Jesus Christ and his promises. Happiness, by the way, and joy are different. A lot of people say things like, I just want to be happy. I know of many marriages who have been ruined because one person wanted to pursue happiness rather than finding joy in their marriage. Only Christ can give you true joy. For myself, playing tennis on a sunny day, that makes me happy. But then we have days where we have 10 inches of snow and I'm no longer in the tennis shape I once was, nor am I the tennis player I once was, and my happiness soon begins to fade. But my joy cannot be taken, to me, taken away from me. My joy is something that cannot be removed because it's based on something that does not change like the weather. It doesn't change like uh, my health or energy levels or my worn out old tennis racket. Joy is evidence of the Holy Spirit's work within me. It is the fruit of the Spirit's presence within me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Christian has joy in their hope, and our hope is unwavering because it rests upon Jesus Christ and his return, what we call the blessed hope. The joy of the Christian rests in the hope we have in Christ and in his return. But we read back in, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. Okay, so... We're, <clears throat> we're kind of diving into a text here in the middle of everything, so we need to understand the context. It opens with two words, actually, that, are, gonna, that are, are meant to force us to look back and understand what's going on before we proceed. I, I say this often, context is key. We don't, we don't just take a verse or a passage and, and make it mean what we want it to mean. We understand, we must seek to understand what the passage is saying all by itself. So, uh, in its context. So Paul uses this word, but, and that tells us he's shifting gears. Whatever he said prior to this, there's going to be a slight contrast of sorts, and he's now going in a different direction as to what has been said. Now, Paul had, in fact, been telling the Thessalonians to love one another, but said they didn't really need to be reminded of that because they do a good job of it already. 
He told them to make it their ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to their own business so that they, pro- they behaved properly with outsiders or unbelievers. And they likely were doing that well too. But like one commentator said, Paul had told them to walk in holiness, harmony, and honesty. But the church at Thessalonica had some concerns. They were worried. And Paul is going to speak to them lovingly, kindly, and he's going to encourage them to relax because it appears they were afraid that they had somehow missed the coming of Christ. In fact, even in his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul will talk more about the things to come. We call this eschatology or the study of things that will take place. Eschatology holds a wide range of things to discuss, more than we can cover in just one Sunday morning sermon. And even though it can apply to what takes place after our deaths and and anything that's coming up, it often is used to refer to biblical prophecy. It seems, as we read the letter, the Thessalonians were worried they'd somehow misunderstood the eschatology of the church and had missed the coming of Jesus. That's what they were worried about. So Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed. Well, who's we? Paul answers this in the first verse of the very first chapter of this letter. Paul himself, Silvanus, who often transcribed letters for Paul and Peter, and Timothy. It's in the greeting. Those three were, in a lot of ways, a powerhouse in the early church. Paul, his disciple Timothy, one of the most brilliant uh, scribes the church would use. I mean, that they're they're writing to this church, likely because they all have a connection to the church. They know who they are, and their passion is that they are not uninformed. The Greek word is agnoein, and it means ignorant. It's just someone can be uneducated, and uninformed, it doesn't mean they're stupid. It just means they don't know. And that's what Paul's saying. I don't want you to not know about this. So here's where we can miss something, though. If we're not careful in our own selves, we can be ignorant of this. We have to understand who the letter is to. To the church, of course, but to Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians alike. Paul begins by saying grace to you and peace. Grace was the Greek greeting. Peace was to the Jewish audience. And this tells us that this church was diverse. And because they were diverse, there was possibility for division. We've seen that take place as well in recent messages. But we see Paul doing this thing to to unite the church, even though they are diverse. He calls them something in our passage today. He calls them brothers. Now, many times we read scripture and we say, well, yeah, we're all brothers in Christ. But we don't think about what that really truly means. We don't understand why the early church used that wording. If you're reading, in fact, in the CSB translation, you may note that it says brothers and sisters. It's a gender neutral Greek word. It's the Greek word adelphoi. And what it means is, well, yes, we are together in Jesus, but that barely scratches the surface. It means we have the same blood, that we are under the blood of Christ. Now, I know there's people I share blood with that I'm not really together with. I mean, Thanksgiving's coming up and there's some family that I have that, yeah, I'll probably cry at their funeral, but I don't want to sit down and eat turkey legs with them. I'm glad they're states away. But the fact is, there are those who we are under the same blood of Christ and I'm very close with them. It's not that Paul is just saying that, yeah, we're just brothers and sisters and we forget about that. What he's truly saying is, brothers, we are all united If you missed the coming of the Lord, then I must have missed the coming of the Lord. And surely they wouldn't think that Paul would would do that. It's a very small but powerful reminder when you see brethren or brothers or brothers and sisters in your Bible. It means you're united with the body of believers. Paul uses this word about 15 times in 1 Thessalonians alone. Brothers, we are united in our hope and we are united in our joy. But we go on. Paul doesn't want them to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that they will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, this word sleep is basically, it's a euphemism for death, at least for as far as Christianity was concerned. And it really begins with Jesus in John chapter 11. Jesus tells the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him. Now, the disciples hear this and they're, they're probably thinking somebody else can wake him up, surely. You know, it's not that big a deal. So they say, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. So Jesus clarifies in one of the most blunt verses in scripture. He says, Lazarus is dead. 
And from that point on, the puzzle pieces the, the puzzle pieces begin to fit together for the disciples. Jesus is uh, saying that death is temporary for us. If we follow Jesus, he has the power to raise the dead. Paul brings this up often in his writings, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 21. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits. In other words, there's going to be second, third, fourth fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Later in Philippians 3, he speaks of the resurrection. He says, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. By the exertion and of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. In other words, we do not grieve and we do not mope. We do not feel ashamed in our death because we have joy in our hope. We follow a teacher who has the power to raise the dead. And that is what Paul reminds the Thessalonians and us about in this text. We may grieve the loss of a friend, yes, or a family member, but death is not goodbye for the follower of Christ. It is always, I will see you later, brother. Hope, if you remember, is the the Greek word elpis. It is an expected, anticipated arrival of something whose timing we just don't know. It's not waiting for something we don't know will ever happen or if it'll happen. It's anticipating something we expect to happen. We do not mourn like those who have no expectation. The atheist who says, this life is all I've got, so that's what I want to live for. The Christian says, I live for this life because I'm living for the next. We walk forward in a faith set on Christ who rose from his grave and who will one day raise us from ours. Hope is the enemy of grief. Grief, by the way, the word Paul uses is lipiste. And as he uses it here, it's, it's meant to be distress or to feel sorrow. It's not to say that you cannot feel pain or longing for your friend or family member who passed away. But the Christian does not feel defeated. The Christian is not overcome by this. In fact, the Christian is a conqueror, an overcomer. In fact, that's what Paul says in Romans 8.37. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We do not suffer in our loss. We hope in it. We rejoice in it because we know it's not really loss. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says we're of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Whatever happens, The Christian can rejoice because our hope, our death, cannot phase us. It's merely a time of sleep. Paul goes on in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. This passage is kind of grabbing the previous stuff and pushing us forward to what very clearly what we call the rapture of the church. And we're going to get more into that as we go this morning. For now, it should suffice that because of that, we we believe that Jesus died, rose again. All those who have died believing in him will be gathered up to join Christ in that moment, in that blessed moment that Paul's referring to here. But there's a small word with a very large meaning there if if we take time to catch it. We cannot let it escape us. It's the word if. If is one of Paul's favorite words. Especially if you've studied Romans, you know its importance. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again. In other words, if we believe the gospel. If we believe the good news. Paul said, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel Paul preaches. If you believe that, if you confess with your mouth, if you... Confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart a person believes leading to righteousness and with the mouth he confesses leading to salvation. If you believe that, you have hope. Then you have hope. And because of that hope, you can have joy. If you believe that, the Holy Spirit has begun to dwell inside you and your life has begun to change. Paul says this. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If. 
if we believe Jesus died and rose again and that he is Lord and that he is worth living our lives for. God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. Jesus told him, Jesus himself told his disciples, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. That's John 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe. And from that belief, hope. And from that hope, you'll have joy. The joy of the Christian rests in the hope we have in Christ and in his return. We read in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. You see what Paul just said here. We say this, by the word of the Lord. In other words, this is true. This is something you can take to the bank. God said it. Now we know all scriptures, God breathed and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, and so on. But this is how we know Paul knows he is writing scripture. He is writing the very word of the Lord. And it's something we know is true. That we who are still living and those of us who remain until this coming of the Lord event won't taste death. We will not go before those who have died because we will not have died ourselves. This is why the Christian does not need to fear their death. Jesus, the apostles, they don't make a big deal about physical death. In fact, we already saw they call it sleep. For the Christian, death is simply a long nap. And some days a long nap doesn't sound so bad to me. That may sound depressing, but it shouldn't. Because when you've worked, when you've strained, when you've stressed, you, your mind, your body, your soul, they need rest. That's all it is. Oswald Chambers once said, Our Lord makes little of physical death, but he makes more of moral and spiritual death. There are many, some we may even know personally, there are many Christians who reject their faith in God and fall away because of a simple misunderstanding concerning death. But we shouldn't. Death is just a nap until the greatest waking up we could ever experience. Some Christians look towards the blessed hope, that that is the rapture that we talk about, out of a fear of death. In fact, I know many Christians, as I get older, I, I see their Facebook posts and the way they talk. People who were my Sunday school teachers at one point, it, it's like they more and more look at the rapture as though it's a, a get out of jail free card. This is the same generation who read the Left Behind books cover to cover 20, 30 years ago. And now they're, they're looking at the rapture as a way to not suffer or have to deal with persecution, things like that. But it, that's not what the rapture is. It's not meant to be understood that way. We don't like the idea of suffering. Who does? Especially in Western culture. But for most of the planet, to be a Christian means to suffer. In a Muslim country, to accept Christ means death. In China, to be a Christian means you worship underground in house churches. Even in Canada, in the past couple of years, to worship, you have to follow strict government guidelines. Or the government will apparently fly helicopters over your property and arrest you in front of your children. We, we saw this happen. But not me, says the American Christian. I'm going to be raptured. Really? Did Jesus promise that? No, he promised these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. Paul says to Timothy, indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. It's, it's not a surprise for the Christian to suffer. The rapture is not a, an excuse to get away from suffering. In fact, suffering, and I don't want to tread too much because there's another sermon coming in this series, but there's joy to be had in suffering. James tells us, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance. The return of Christ is our hope. It's not a, well, now I don't have to pay back my credit card debt sort of thing. It's a hope we look forward to that removes the sting of death. You see, too many Christians let death defeat them. What Paul does not say is that we should fear something, that we should fear anything. 
He doesn't make light of death either. He doesn't say that we can't feel loss, but that we as Christians do not mourn because death is not the same thing for us. Sometimes you'll be at a funeral or someone will use this text, the pastor or the priest, whatever. They'll say something like, Old Henry, he was a good Christian. And because of this text in 1 Thessalonians, we know he's up there with the angels worshiping. Well, it's not necessarily wrong. That's great for Henry. But really, if you think about it, what encouragement is that for those of us who loved him? There's not the joy of our hope. We're left behind. We're left to still be here. Early Christians found their hope in the day of the Messiah, and we should too. Whether we die or whether we live, our hope rests in Christ's return. Paul says to the Philippians, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. That's what he's referring to. But each in his own order, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming, and so on. Paul does not say here that the Christians who died are at peace and in heaven. Because they're dead, they're not reading this. It's irrelevant. It's not to say it's not true, but they're not reading this letter. They're not the ones who believe they've been left behind somehow. This is for us. This is for the readers. And for us, it is more important to understand what lies ahead and live and hope towards that. In other words, if death gets you, okay, you're absent from the body, you're present with Christ. If death does not get you and you're one of those family members left standing at the funeral, well, let your joy continue in the hope that you may not experience death too. And then we go to verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus will come down with this shout, the shout being the very voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and those who've fallen asleep, the dead in Christ, they will rise first. Now, until this happens, we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. He doesn't go anywhere else, it seems. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 makes this very clear. Having accomplished cleansing for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This also fulfills Jesus' words of John 14 and the words of the angels from Acts 1, 11, when Luke writes, they also, they, they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Now, that's there's kind of like a double meaning there, and I kind of got away from my notes when I said this on Sunday, and I'll say it again. So many Christians are looking up for the return of Christ. When's he coming back? When's he coming back? But we're not doing the work Christ has given us to do, to go and prepare the world for his return, to go out and share the gospel, to share Jesus, so that others are looking for his return. The disciples were staring up, but the angels had to say, no, 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 stop stop looking up and start going out. Start doing what he commanded you to do. Now, speaking of angels, not much is known about their rankings. I know First Thessalonians mentions archangels, but not much about their positions is really given to us in Scripture. In fact, Paul warns us to be careful how much attention we pay to them when he writes, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he's seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. In other words, don't get sidetracked trying to study angels. And one of the things we should keep in mind is most of the writings we have concerning angelic hierarchy comes from non-biblical sources that happen to be written around the intertestamental periods, the meaning between the Old and New Testament. And much of what was written was by Jewish men writing oral traditions. And we know how Jesus felt about the oral traditions surrounding scripture. He had very little if no respect for them. Possibly the voice of the archangel is that of Michael. We see him in Daniel 10 or another high-ranked angel like Gabriel or somebody like that, but we don't know. If we're not careful, we begin to lose our focus on all our efforts on understanding what the point is. The point is it comes with a shout, with a trumpet blast, because it's a celebration. It's a moment of victory. 
It begins the procession of the King of Kings, the day of the Lord. Matthew 24, 31 tells us, He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. This is a trumpet of judgment, but to be clear, it is not the trumpet judgments we see later in Revelation 8 through 11. There is judgment taking place. The dead who are in Christ and those who are living and in Christ will join him in the air. Those who are not are left behind. That is a form of judgment. But that's not meant to be a scare tactic or meant to worry anyone. It is meant to be a moment of joy. Paul says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. This is the sort of trumpet call that we're, we really get a, a preview of in Exodus 19, way back in the Old Testament. Uh, the people of Israel are gathered around Mount, Mount Sinai, and this is what it reads in verses 16 through 19. So it happened on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yahweh descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. This is a trumpet call to the people of God to meet with God. It is a trumpet of deliverance. As we see this in Zephaniah 1.16, the the day of trumpet and loud shouting against the fortified cities and the high corner towers we see in zechariah 9 14 then yahweh will appear over them and his arrow will go forth like lightning and the lord yahweh will blow the trumpet and will go in the storm winds of the south this is a moment of victory this is a moment of joy and it is a joy that we hope in and the dead in christ shall rise first you see to die as a believer whether it's a as a persecuted martyr or a follower of Christ who expires because of natural causes, it is the privilege of the believer to die in Christ. They will be the first to join him in that glorious moment. They get to cut in line, as it were. And our joy, whether we are living or not, our joy as Christians rests in the hope we have in Christ and in his return. We go back to verse 17 as we begin to wrap this up. Then, We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. You may be sitting here and saying, well, we're talking about the rapture an awful lot. I don't really see that word in my Bible. And you would be absolutely right. You won't see words like Trinity or creed in your Bible either. They're English words we use to describe or illustrate a biblical concept. We get the idea from a Greek word in this text when Paul says that those who will remain will be caught up or snatched away. The the root Greek word is harpazo, and it means to take away, to seize, to be caught up. The English word rapture usually means ecstatic joy or delight, joyful ecstasy. But it can also mean an older English version of it means to get caught up in something. Hence the term rapture is perfect to describe this event. When we are raptured up into the clouds, we meet the Lord in the air. This is where our true joy lands. And so we shall always be with the Lord. In this hope we have joy. In Revelation 3.10, we see Jesus make this promise to the church of Philadelphia. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also keep you from the hour of testing which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. It's interesting, people who study Greek and and Hebrew and things like that often miss this, but that word keep, in fact, the whole phrase, I will keep you, it literally means to take someone into custody, to take them from where they are and put them somewhere else, as in the Lord taking us and placing us with himself. What are we doing when when we are with the Lord? or worshiping him. We are worshiping him alongside other saints, alongside the angels for all eternity. And Revelation paints this picture for us, and it's so beautiful. 
In Revelation 4, we see four creatures surrounding the throne of heaven and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings or full of eyes around and within. In the day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And then later, there's more worship as the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they'll cast their crowns before his throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. And still later in Revelation 5, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them were myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then, in Revelation 5, every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worship. But catch this, Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. The blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and power and the strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Guys, if you're listening to this, hear me. Every nation, all tribes, people, tongues, that's us. That is those of us who placed our faith in Christ. We are the ones in Revelation 7 singing. Let me tell you something. If someone says, I don't want to go to church because all they do is sing songs about Jesus. All they do is talk about Jesus. They worship Jesus. And I don't like being around other people. And I don't like singing. And I don't like talking about Jesus. Those are the words of someone who would be absolutely miserable in heaven. Chances are, if they don't want to go to church... They don't want to go to heaven. It's that simple. Church is a foretaste of what heaven should look like. Believers worshiping together. It is a taste of that blessed hope, that moment when we are all together worshiping our Savior for all eternity. I'm not saying, and I know some people will take this and try to turn it and twist it around. I'm not saying you have to go to church to be saved. I'm saying that if you are saved, you should want to go to church because if heaven is inside of you, you'll want heaven all around you. This is a source of joy for the Christian if indeed we are Christian. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, Paul says. All of this is a source of hope, a source of comfort for the believer. The word for comfort also means convict. It's how we urge one another on. Paul wants to encourage the believer. He wants to bring hope to the believer. He wants those who suffer loss, those who mourn when their brothers and sisters are martyred. He wants them to stay focused on the prize. He wants you and me to stay focused on what lies ahead, not what lies behind us. He wants us to keep our focus on Jesus, our Savior, who will return for us one day. And even if he does not, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to King Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to save us, but if not, let it be known we are not going to serve the gods of this world. We will not worship the golden image. We worship Christ. Church, the joy in our hope does not rest on the fact that God always fixes our situation. He may not. God may not heal us. God may not send rain during every drought. He may not stop every lion's mouth. He may not scatter and confuse all our enemies. He may not feed us with ravens and quench our thirst with dew, as he has done for people in the past. But if church history has taught us anything, it is this. And if you're a royal ranger in the assemblies of God, you know what I'm talking about. Be ready. The Christian life is a life of joyful readiness. A life of joyful, expectant hope. 
because we're in Christ and Christ is in us and Christ is coming back for us someday. And it may be this side of the grave and it may be that our physical bodies are resting in a wooden box when that trumpet sounds. It does not change him. It does not change our passion for him. It will not rob us of our joy in him because it cannot take away our hope that rests in him. I'm going to move to close in just a second, but I'm going to remind you of that quote that I mentioned earlier. He that lives in hope dances without music. I would ask you, where is your hope? I imagine if you know where you have placed your hope, there you will find your joy. For the Christian, our joy can be found in our hope in Christ's return. Not a hope that it someday might happen, but the confident expectation that it will. Today, if you're here, there's and you're listening to this, there's no shame in admitting your joy is gone, that it has been wore thin, or maybe you've let it go in exchange for anger, bitterness, shame. That list goes on and on. But if you're listening and you're saying, I want my joy back, then I would challenge you to begin by looking to hope that we have in Christ and in his return. That we do not mourn when we experience loss as our Brothers and sisters sleep in Christ. We do not fear the future. We look towards that day when there will be a great shout of victory and the dead in Christ arise and we all join together to meet him in the air and always be with the Lord in his presence. If you're here or listening to this and your joy has been eroded, if you can't remember the last time you felt excited to pray or read your Bible or excited to attend church, then I would ask you to take some time today, find a place to pray. We'll be praying for you. Pray that you experience joy once again. Maybe grab someone, grab your wife, your husband, if you're listening to this, and ask them to pray with you that God return your joy and the hope you have in his return. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Father God, I pray right now, whoever's listening to this, whoever's possibly watching the video on YouTube or whatever, Father, I pray you speak to their heart and bring the joy that they desperately need in their hope in you. Lord, we know you're returning someday. And I pray we look forward to it in joy. Father, when the world beats us down, makes us bitter, makes us angry, I pray you remind us through the power of your Holy Spirit of your joy that you give us. I pray above all things, you are blessed by this today. That you use this message to pierce hearts, change minds, and save souls. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.